start right into the wind. Right All right, let's, uh, sorry for the delay. Let's get started. Thanks, thanks for everybody for coming. Do you want to maybe lower the light? Let's just get into the good one. I know, I know. We'll talk about that in a second. We'll go over the, we'll go over the <laughs> conference and then we'll talk about, uh, what are you talking about? Uh, boating. So Where thanks. Your family picture taken? This, this picture? No, the, the family picture that you had on. Uh, oh, Cedar Point? Cedar. This, this year's um, uh, family vacation. So thanks for coming. We're going to talk about adjacent level generation and I like to go over our cases, uh, individual cases, because um, they have uh, they're easy to remember, and 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 they're real. So this is a 75 year old man. That's not a picture of him, but it lo he looks very similar to that, uh, with a chronic low back pain, and he was admitted to the hospital, and uh, he had a seven day history of inability to walk, due to severe pain in his back and legs, and he has a chronic uh, low back pain. Um, he has a history of a cabbage uh, in January, so seven months ago, and he was on aspirin and Plavix for that. And um, he has a cardiac pacemaker and three spinal surgeries in the last 18 months. The la the three spinal surgeries in the last five or six years, the last one 18 months ago. And um, <coughs> on exam, I'll go over the x-rays. On exam, he's bedridden. He, can he cannot move. He's been in bed for seven days, and he has severe sciatica pain down his uh, posterior buttocks and legs. Uh, and he has uh, significant weakness. His quadriceps are two out of five motors. So without a quadriceps, you can't walk. Uh, and the rest of his exam was two out of five motor. Hip flex is one out of five motor. And he was b basically bedridden. And I just wanted to go over this um, diagram to show the pattern of uh, uh, sciatic distribution. So lateral border of the foot, posterior thigh, posterior uh, calf, lateral calf, lateral border of the foot is more like S1. L5 is very similar, lateral thigh, anterior lateral leg, dorsum, like anterior in, uh, structures of the leg, and to the first first toe, dorsum of the foot is L5. L4, usually patients usually say it goes to my knee, lateral thigh to my knee, and medial leg, and then uh, L3 is in the front of the thigh. So this is his chest x-ray pre-op, and I'm going to ask Alan to uh, just remember this, because I'm going to show you the post-op and tell me what you think. Uh, and he has a cardiac pacemaker. And pre-op he was okay, breathing. Uh, this is pre-op chest x-ray. Yeah, And uh, has got cardiomegaly. Cardiomegaly. It's got some fluid and transverse fissure. Okay, right here. Um, um, this is a great pacemaker, obviously. Right there? Yeah. And a pacemaker. So we couldn't get, because of that, we couldn't get a um, uh, an MRI. And he's on Plavix. So, um, Doug, what's your experience with uh, doing surgery on Plavix? Or do you have any experience? Or what are your thoughts? So Plavix, as we all know, clopidogrel is a um, uh, platelet, inhibitor. Platelet, platelet inhibitor. Like I think it affects the ADP in the cell membrane of platelets. Yeah. And um, do you have a policy for, like, let's say you have a hip fracture, for example, that comes in with on Plavix? Most people surveyed said that they, they do hip fractures with Plavix. The only difference is you're not getting a spinal line. So if you have a fracture, most people usually operate through Plavix, but you don't get a, sp a spinal. And it's variable how long it, um, anesthesia will uh, want you to be off it for about a week sometimes if they're going to do a spinal. Before you do an epidural, yeah. So the in the anesthesia literature, aspirin's okay. Right. They'll do an epidural on aspirin, but they will not do an epidural on Plavix. Right. And the fear is an epidural bleed. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so you just operate through it, yep. usually? Okay. How about elective cases? Yeah. Elective cases uh, depends on what kind of anesthesia we're going to give them. You know, we tell them. Uh, How about, the, let me give you a scenario. A patient with severe hip pain, they just had a cabbage three months ago, drug eluding. No, just say they had a drug eluding stent three months ago. They have to be on Plavix for six months, otherwise it's extremely high rate for a heart attack. Yep. patient wants to have a hip replacement. The cardiologist says there's no way they can come off Plavix for six months. What do you do? Operate through it. For a hip replacement? Hip replacement. Elective. Uh, a bad example. If you have to do it, yeah, I, I think you can operate through it. What, what, uh, Alan, do you have any thoughts? You know, there's well, a high, higher rate of bleeding or hematoma or complications. So right. It's clearly not an ideal role. Yeah. Well, I don't know how, how long is the effect of Plavix if you stop taking it? When is the effect? Well, 
I was going to ask you guys that. I, was, I, I think a week, yeah, five yeah. days. I think it's like three to five yeah. days, so yeah. anesthesia sort of knee jerks, you know, seven days. Yeah, so. I looked it up for this man, and in the cabbage literature, which they deal with this all the time, five days uh, is enough. Mm -hmm. Like, if you wait longer than five days, there's no added benefit. You no. use Lovenox? Yeah, Lovenox is twenty. Like yeah, Lovenox is twenty four hours. Bridge therapy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but Plavix is a different actor than Lovenox. Right. Then it doesn't work for these uh, stents that are coated you know, or anything like that. Though. It's interesting. Yeah. You're not really in the journal, not directly connected with this about bridging therapy, and they took a whole bunch of people, did not give them bridging therapy. With their own normally you stop the warfarin, put them on something like like stuff you have, and then the surgery's over, put them on. Coming in, so they didn't give them any bridging therapy. Just stopped the warfarin, did the, sur did the surgery, then restarted the warfarin. They found that um, the group without bridging therapy did not have any increase in thrombotic episodes, and they actually had less bleeding. So, what, what, can you repeat it one more time? The group that had no bridging yeah. did fine. Did not. You would expect that they'd get problems. Thrombotic problems episodes. Yeah. Thrombotic problems. But right. They didn't. They did not. And in fact, they had less bleeding in the bridging therapy. Yeah. Right. So I believe it. Do you want my send you the <coughs> That's the big problem with these, uh, you know, doing DVT prophylaxis and all these knee and uh, hip studies. You know, they have a high degree of uh, hematomas that need drainage yeah. and wound necrosis much higher than they have thrombotic episodes, you know. Where yeah. Yeah. So, so the yes. Complication rate. You know, the, the complication rates from the treatment is worse than the disease you're trying to prevent. Yeah. You need really big numbers to prove it too. Yeah. Uh, to see what the effect is. I would guess that you know compression therapy and early ambulation is the answer. Yeah, and what always happens is a doctor, you do surgery on your next door neighbor, and they get a blood clot, and then everybody gets maximal therapy. So the, when, the, when, you, when you have a severe complication, you never forget the complication. Uh, and I think all surgeons have had these complications with blood clots and PEs and deaths. I mean, it's a very difficult subject to deal with, don't you think, Doug? I mean, for me, I, it was a constant problem. It's extremely controversial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. So this is an article in the Surgeon, Neurosur International Neurological Surgery uh, Journal where they reviewed 100 patients that had spine surgery on Plavix and aspirin of oh, clobidogrel. They did fine, no complications at all. Kind of interesting. Um, that, this was, that was recent, that was um, August 2000, uh, a year ago. Um, 2011, Journal of Spine, this is just a case of a patient who's on uh, clopidogrel plavix and suffered a um, postoperative epi symptomatic epidural hematoma 12 days out. So you would think 12 days out from surgery, you're fine, but no, you can still get a bleed at the surgical site. What is your, Doug, what's your uh, rule of thumb? When can you start Plavix after surgery? I mean, I don't think that's been studied. When is it safe? I mean, I'll tell you, I do, I do three days. Where I came up with that, I have no idea. I just figure in three days, usually most of the bleeding's done from a surgery. The, the cardiologist wants you to do it right away. It, it, I think, in, from my practice, it depends on what I'm doing. If, it, it, it's different if you're doing a joint or a spine versus a yeah. Know, say hip replacement. I know you're not a spine surgeon. Hip, hip hip replacement when you mm -hmm. start. I think I think the bleeding episodes I'm, are similar. I'm treating people with uh, SCDs uh, day of, but I think the, it's kind of a coin toss. I I start them when they're stable when they're not bleeding anymore. Yeah, and it's a you know. Blue, Weighing the risk and benefits of uh, bleeding versus why they're on it. A lot. So many of these people are just <coughs> on it just because they're on it. You know, they, yeah. they're on a plavix, but they, you know, they don't have AFib or anything like that. Yeah. They're just on it because they have a stem. Yeah. Which is probably clotted a, you know, a week after it's put in anyway. Right? Yeah. So let's go back to our guy. So he's, uh, this is a cast scan of him two years ago, and he's had a fusion L3, L4, L5. You can see this screws the artifact. And look at L2, L3, it looks totally normal. That's two years ago. Now, when he comes to the ER this time, you see the screws L3, L4, L5, S1. By the way, I, I didn't do the index surgery, the first surgery. And he's got a severe deformity above it at L2, L3. And the L2 vertebral body is posteriorly displaced from L3. Can you guys see that? Mm -hmm. and, and there's also a fracture of the inferior end plate of L2. Uh, and there's also kyphosis. I'll show you this uh, drawing uh, at L2, L3. And uh, he also has a fracture of L1, which um, 
you can see the superior amplitude valve one is a bit broken. <coughs> on, the, on the AP view, not much to show, a little bit of scoliosis. So just as a um, refresher, verbal body, pedicle discs, and you should have lordosis in the lumbar spine normally. So let's measure this guy. This guy, you should have about five or six degrees of lordosis or backwards tilt at L203. He's got 15 degrees of kyphosis, the wrong direction. So he's, he's bending forwards. And you can see on the, on the side view, uh, from L1 to S1, he has 30 degrees of lordosis. It should be 60. So he, he's, uh, his back is bent forwards. So he's not, he doesn't have an upright posture. This is not even a standing view because he's not strong enough to stand. So he's probably even worse when he stands up. So he has loss of normal lordosis. And if you measure, mm -hmm. what's that done? If you Just looking at that level, what is it, L3, L4, too? It looks like the, that's not fused also. It's not. Actually, that's a very astute observation. I'll show you how it's not fused. So if you measure the retrolisthesis, the yellow line, it measures 14 millimeters, and the whole end plate's 43 millimeters. So it's about 33% uh, subluxated. So the vertebral body is a third backwards from where it should be. And the gravity line typically goes from C2 uh, through T12 <laughs> and through the top of the sacrum. But as you develop kyphosis, and uh, some people say that aging is a kyphotic, uh, kyphosis is an aging deformity. It's like as we get older, we get more kyphotic for some reason. We just lean forwards more. Um, the gravity line pitches forwards, and it's very exhausting for patients. So it's not good to be pitched forward. It's kind of like the leaning tower of Pisa. So if you're pitched forward, it's very, very tiring because you're constantly trying to bend backwards. Um, normally, this is, this is normal uh, numbers for lordosis. Um, it should be about 60 degrees, and an L2, L3 in this, in this article was about 7 degrees of lordosis is typical. And these are all the uh, angles. Um, so the other thing is for me to, for me to measure lordosis or people's spinal uh, contour in the office, it's easy. I tell them to put their heels, their, their butt, and their back of their head against the door. And then I measure how far the head is from the door. And that can just gives you just a general idea of how bent forward there are. Hip flexion contractures also can cause a problem too. So if they have a hip flexion contracture, they can't do it as well. And usually they come together. The people with uh, lordose, uh, loss of lordosis of lumbar spine also have hip flexion contractures. Sometimes they're stiff, sometimes they're um, mobile. And um, preoperatively, if you lay somebody flat and you, uh, you look at their hip flexion contractures, it's important because if you fix the spine, the hip, fl the hip flexion contracture is still there. So I very commonly send them to physical therapy uh, to help with the um, hip, what do you guys do for hip flexion contractures? What do you? How do you do it? How do you do it? Like releases. What do you do? Lay them on their side or the back or belly or. Usually, it's the stretch would be sideline. On the side, yeah. and bend it. Okay. Kind of like what this this cartoon is doing. Bending back, okay. And the other thing we used to tell kids is, is, is to try to sleep on your belly and stretch your hip flex. Do you have a trick, Doug? The, the, we used to tell the kids, uh, the hip flexion contractors, the moms who had the children with cerebral palsy, hip flexion contractors, lay them on their belly and try to stretch their hips that way. It's hard for adults to do that. Adults, adults don't tolerate that sort of thing. Um, so we went over that. So this, pa this patient had a, um, had a, pacemaker so he needed a myelogram so here's a myelogram the radiologist inserted the needle through the laminectomy defect so it was easy for him uh, and um, you can see the destructive process above the elf, the, the top screw it's, it's almost like a shark code joint so this thing's been going on for a very long time and the um, the L2 body is basically destroyed and you can see the very top screw you can see how there's a black halo line around the screw he has halo loosening of L3. So Doug, when Doug said it's not healed, what happens is L3 does not fuse to L4. There's motion between L3 and L4, and then the screws are still intact. They're not loose. So what happens is uh, everything's moving up on that top screw, and you can see that, that motion is causing that defect. You see how that black line across the screws? <coughs> this is called the halo loosening sign. And these are the axial cuts. Uh, you can see L3, L4 is stenotic. The, the, you look at L4, the, the canal is nice and big. The canal should look um, nice, a nice round circle. And you can see the circle at L3, L4 is stenotic. And all the screws, I get a casket to make sure the screws are in good position. Um, this just shows a destructive process L2. You can see 
uh, around the L2 vertebra, you see all that callus bone. The L203 disc space is severely deteriorated. And you, again, you can see the, see the black line all around the screws. That's from motion. So we call this, uh, in spine, we call it like a windshield wiper effect. The body's shifting back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, and it's eroding the bone. So these screws, you can just pull them out with your hand. There's, there's nothing holding the screws in. And that's what happens if the spine doesn't heal. So the three, the, so he has a non-union. This, this is called the pedicle screw halo effect. You can see along the screws, you can see the black line all around the screws from the motion. And here's our patient. He also, you can see that the pedicle is fractured, I think. See this, this is not, this shouldn't be like that. It turned out intraoperatively that he had, he had both pedicle fracture and, um, and a pars fracture. So L304 was basically destroyed. And it, he, had, he had like a sharp code joint at L304. It's a really bad case. And you can see the stenosis of the spinal canal centrally. It should be a big circle, and you can see this is not a circle. He had severe pressure there at L3, L4. Uh, the L3, L4 foramen was tight as well. On the sagittal cuts, again, you can see the halo about the screw, and you can see the, the level of the deformity right here. See how the vertebral body is backwards. Of L2, L2 is backwards on L3. And this just shows you at, at L2, L3, we should have six or seven degrees of lordosis. He has 14 degrees of kyphosis. And you can see how destroyed L2, L3 is. So this is a, this is a very bad case. I mean, he's, uh, he's got a deformity. He's severely stenotic. He can't walk. Um, now, preoperatively, um, he hadn't walked in a week, so I got a, a duplex study. And I did this for a reason. I'll tell you why. Uh, it was negative. Um, that's his duplex study. He had no... There was an article, not an article, a poster at the academy this year in Las Vegas. And what these people did, um, where was it? It was in Japan. What they did is they, um, they studied sp spine patients pre-op and post-op, patients who've never had a blood clot and never had symptoms. And, they wanted, and the question is, do these people have blood clots? And the reason is patients who have uh, pain don't walk. So these people are coming into surgery with a blood clot already. And it's asymptomatic, and the findings were um, were quite dramatic. Preoperatively, 1.8 one patient, 1.8 percent had a pulmonary embolism, and three and a half percent had a DVT preop. So the venous uh, thromboembolism rate was five percent, which is amazing. So one out of 20 of these spine patients had either a blood clot or a PE that was asymptomatic. So if, they, if this became symptomatic post-op, they would attribute it to the surgery, but it wasn't. It was a pre-op problem. And then post-op, there, there was a really high rate, too. There was a 15% uh, rate of DVT and PE. So these rates are really high. So I, I don't know what to make of, these, um, of this study, except um, I have an extremely low threshold to get the test to see if they have a blood clot. What, any thoughts about this? So it's like 5% five, 5 pre-op spine patients have blood clots. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense because these people aren't walking. They're not using their leg because it hurts. Um, okay, so back to our uh, guy. So I wanted to fix this deformity because orthopedic surgeons, we always like to, we like to make crooked things straight. It's kind of like in our DNA, so to speak. So there's different ways you can do it. You can remove the pedicle. You can do a pedicle subtraction osteotomy and you take a wedge out of the spine, you can see that wedge on the left, and then you bend it backwards, and then you, uh, you make it straighter. And you can do this through osteotomes. Also at the academy this year, someone created this new osteotome just for that exact purpose. And um, I toyed with the idea of trying to find it and buy it, but I just I didn't do it. I just did it the old school way. And um, so you can also, you can cut through the pedicle and then take a lot of body out, or you can cut through the disc space and take the, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Um, this is another way to do it. You just take the pedicle out and then go through the body. I usually, if I, I prefer to take the disc out too, so then I have um, uh, an anterior fusion as well. Um, so you can imagine you're taking this, this pedicle out. Here's the pedicle. You take that whole pedicle out, and then the nerve above and the nerve below have plenty of room after you bring it backwards because if you bring it if you bring it backwards you'll compress the nerve roots so so any questions about pedicle subtraction osteotomy it's a very big surgery so here's my pre-op before I do these deformity cases I, I just photocopy it I turn my cell phone off I tell people not to talk to me and I think about it for a couple of minutes for 10-15 minutes how am I going to do this 
So preoperatively, I thought this was the best way to do it. Question Here's though, Andy, yeah. you've done that, but how do you realign two with three? Through the screws and rods. Hmm? Through the screws and rods, you yeah. can push and distract and pull. So um, it's basically like a little tinker, like a like a tinkering set. You just do, you can pull things backwards, forwards, you bend them, different ways. So um, here's um, here's my preoperative plan. Um, I basically felt if I could remove the inferior half of L2, which is which is abnormal, and it's right where his problem is, uh, I could straighten him out, and he looked totally normal. And uh, I also would have to take out the pedicle of three because otherwise the L2 and the L3 nerve roots would be compressed against the pedicle. You can't you can't change it without removing the pedicle. So this was my pre-op plan, and you can see this is how they used the uh, the special osteotome to do the in that study. And the the main thing to the take-home message, message for pedicle subtraction osteotomy, I think I've done six or seven so far in my career, is this extremely high uh, complication rate. It's a very technically very difficult surgery, and is the, it's almost 100% complication rate. And in this study in the academy, uh, the complication rate, they had six patients with eight major complications, so it's greater than 100%. Um, these are the two groups, and the complications were stroke, pulmonary embolism, heart failure, aspiration, pneumonia, ultimate exercise, revision, operation. Um, so it's a, it's a very high risk uh, surgery. So um, I performed the surgery exactly as planned, and here's his post-op um, alignment, and you can see he's, it's very nice lordosis and nearly completely reduced AP views normal. And um, here's another view. You can see here's the, the, the on the left is the post-op, on the right is the pre-op. So you can see how he's not deformed anymore and he's mostly lined up. And um, the surgery took four and a half hours and I did it as fast as possible, you know, not, so he doesn't lose a lot of blood. And you can see here the holes where the screws were. See how big they are? You can imagine the screws were moving through there and you can see the now between L2 and L3, that's going to fuse together. And I did a very wide decompression um, of the nerve roots, uh, L2 and L3, to take all the pressure off that area. And you can see this very big hole here that I created to completely expose all the nerve roots and, and make sure they're free. And now the post-op uh, sagittal cut, lateral view, you can see it. Before he had, uh, I think it was 15, 14 degrees of kyphosis, now he has 18 degrees of lordosis, so it was a 30 degree change. And you can see the back of that bone was removed. And he's almost perfectly aligned uh, translation wise. He's six millimeters translated posteriorly. So it's, very, it's not perfect, but it's very close. I tried to get it perfect, but it was really hard. And at some point, you have to make a judgment call. It's like, well, I, you know, I'm not, I can't be perfect. This is as, as good as I can get. But everything was accomplished. Like his nerves were opened, uh, his nerves were completely very compressed. And I had to go up to T12 because L1 had a, had a fracture. You see, L1 has a superior end plate fracture. So I had to go up to 12 so I can have a good screw at the very top. So, so how long ago did you do this surgery? Last week. Oh, okay. So you don't you don't know whether are, are the nerve roots damaged enough that they may not recover? And that's all. The, that's a lot of displacement. Uh, yeah. So he was not walking. Up. Yeah. So. Just straightening the uh, the child. Uh, He's dramatically will necessarily improve the nerve root damage. Yeah, well, will he will he have will he have re resolution of pain? So he couldn't even get out of you bed. You said the quadriceps were out completely. They're out. He can stand now, so I think that's a win already. And he can he doesn't have leg pain anymore. He just has back pain from surgery. Yeah. So it's already helped. This is his post op X ray. So Alan, what do you think? This is his complication. Well, is it's it not some right lower lobe? I don't know if it's partly from the edema or if it's just uh, an infiltrate pneumonia. Yeah, no, no fever, no white count. Yeah. So we're just we're just treating this like atelectasis for now, and like pulmonary toilet, and trying to get him to walk and stand, and sit in the chair. So so far, this is our only complication. So um, so any questions about this? This deformity, pedicle subtraction, osteotomy. What do cardiologists think about the actor? Well, how was it reported? Um, increased vasculature and... Um, I wouldn't call it atelectasis because he doesn't really have much loss of volume. His diaphragm still at the, the same height. They said um, infiltrate, but they didn't. that's all they said. Yeah. The, other th the other issue is this person had a... When he was fused to L3, he also had a laminectomy. So I never do full laminectomies 
infusions because I feel there's a higher incidence of exactly what this guy got. So if you take the whole lamina off during a fusion, the next level up wears out very quickly. So I just do a one-sided laminotomy and keep the majority of the facets and the inner spines processes intact so this does not happen. But this happens all the time. Spina bifida and neurosurgica. Yeah, yeah, that's what we call it, yeah. So you basically de de create the, as a surgeon creates a defect in the lamina, which extremely weakens the uh, spine. And that's why this happened. I gotta go, but uh, one thing I wanted to add is that in a couple of meetings I've been to, there's a real emphasis now on looking at um, you know, vitamin D and, and calcium metabolism because these people, they're all sort of, the, you know, you talk about Charco and uh, diabetes and he's at multiple joint levels. Yeah. The majority of these people are uh, vitamin D deficient. They never see the sun. They never see the sun. And yeah. So that's, so he, a lot of times, you know, you do great surgery and it uh, goes to Kaplui and, you know, someone, some genius figures out, you know, six months later or something, just give them a pill. So I think some, a lot of these people who have uh, failed spine, you know, fusion surgery, failed orthopedic surgery, a lot of them have, they have metabolically underlying reasons. No, you're right, actually. I should, I should make a, I should do that more often, put everybody on so calcium. Like on all hip fractures, you know, there's a pathway now that everyone gets checked for this stuff ahead of time. And, and I can tell you, the, pa the way the pathway works, only half of the people get checked just, just coming through this hospital. And then hardly anyone gets put on uh, discharge vitamin D, even though they're, you know, uh, low vitamin D. For it's, it's crazy. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I mean, as a society, we're osteoporotic as we get older. So, yeah. I mean, I think it's changing, though. People are more in tune to it. It's not, you know, it's not zero like it used to be. So any other questions about this case? A little bit. So next, uh, next one's going to be uh, low back pain with normal x-ray. All right, thanks. Hey, yeah, guys, you have the first Friday? Should be first Friday. I'll send you an email, though. Check okay, your email. Sorry. Any questions, uh, guys, uh, about anything? About the deformity and all right